to everyone, especially if you're visiting us today or haven't seen you for a while. It's lovely to see some of you back again. It's great. And our minister, Reverend David Barnes, is leading our worship today. And please do stay for refreshments in the hall after the service. Six o'clock tonight, we will pray for Israel, as they usually do in the lounge. And then our evening worship will be in the hall, and this week we will celebrate communion at the end. Tomorrow, Monday, the first Monday in the month, at half past two, we have the missionary prayer meeting. If you have never been before, always be most welcome to come along. It is led by our Paul, and we remember particularly Judy Cook in Thailand, Guinness family in Burundi, Tim and Linda, Mary and Martin, Barbara, and others. Tuesday, the East Preston Group Home Group Meet, and that is at the home of Edwin and Rosemary Cottingham. Wednesday, Church Members Meeting, which I think you all probably should know. Our agendas are all me as you leave, do take one. And if you're unable to go and you are a church member, do please let me know. This helps. Um, Thursday, Babies and Toddlers Group starting up again, so particularly a prayer for them, just some, some new mums may be well coming for the first time. Then on Saturday, 2.30, the Torch Fellowship. Next Sunday, both services will be led by David, and the evening worship at half past six is one when we have a time to share with each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Good to see you. Just to mention that uh, there will be a day of prayer here. It's, it's not just here. Um, it's a number of churches that are having this day of prayer together. So the church will be open from 10 o'clock through to 4 o'clock, right through, uh, on the 16th of September, Friday the 16th of September. So the church will be open um, and uh, it's for you to come in and go out whenever's convenient for you and just take time to, to pray. Uh, there'll be various aids here to help you with prayer as well, should you want those. Uh, but it's really looking at the state of our nation and so forth and really praying for a, a work of God. So, um, Friday the 16th of September, between 10 and 4. Um, <clears throat> uh, we're actually uh, clearing this stage for a baptism on Tuesday. It's a kind of private baptism. Uh, and uh, it's, at the moment, it's Steve Lies and myself uh, moving stuff. So if you feel strong and able, one or two could help with moving things, then that would, uh, that would be great. Thanks. Okay, Ephesians 2 verse 5, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Well, we're going to sing about that grace now as we sing the hymn, Lord, the light of your love is shining. It's number 445.
we were created and all that exists. You are the author of physical light. You've given us the sun and the moon. But you're also the source of true spiritual and moral light. In you is meaning and truth. And we would come to you this morning in humility, recognising the darkness of our own sins, where we have not been receptive to your light, but gone our own way and failed you. This also has affected our relationships adversely. But we thank you for your promises surrounding forgiveness of sins, the light of your mercy and your grace. For if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We will also pray for our nation in this regard, through turning our backs on you and in pride thinking we know better. We have embraced erroneous ideologies contrary to your word and set groups of people against one another. Our anger has led to hostilities and violence. Lawlessness plagues our cities. We have embraced sexual immorality and with it the breakdown of family life. And we have idolised money, that false god, the love of which is a root of all kinds of evil. Yet each one says, I have done nothing wrong. O Lord, grant repentance to the hard-hearted and arrogant, the self-blinded. Protect the weak. Have mercy on our nation. We would pray for revival in our country. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Thank you for your great love that sets us free from our sins. Lord Jesus, you say, if you hold to my teaching, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you should die for us, so we can know forgiveness and new life in you, not counting men's sins against them. Thank you for sending us the Holy Spirit. He fills us and leads us into your truth. He assures us that we belong to you and the Father, and that one day we will share eternity with you. Your light penetrates and illuminates our lives in every way, and we praise you for it, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we explore, um, we explore the theme of anger, of anger, and how to deal with that as Christians. There is a righteous anger, it's true. There's also a sinful anger that springs from pride and leads to war. The Lord's humility challenges proud anger. And let's meditate now on the humility of Christ and his sacrifice for us. We're going to do that through a couple of songs. The first is a hymn, You Laid Aside Your Majesty. So let's, uh, let's do that now. Worship the Lord singing this hymn, You Laid Aside Your Majesty.
song now called At the Foot of the Cross. I'll just invite you just to, there were some images coming up on the screen and some of the words of the song, and just meditate on those and the way that the Lord forgave those who persecuted him. Reflect on all he's done for us at the cross. Show me your love through the 
few moments to do that, to lay our burdens down before the Lord. Scripture says, cast all your anxiety on the Lord because he cares for you. A few quiet moments to do that now. The monastic writers remind us of our need to follow Christ, especially in his humility and in his surrender to the Father's will. Cuthbert of Northumbria, who lived between 635 and 87 uh, AD, led a life of prayer on the island of Lindisfarne. And I'm going to read some of his prayers, which I think we can make our own. They're actually mingled in, and uh, scriptures mingled in with his prayers. So the first is called prayer. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject or forsake me, O God, my Saviour. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path. Lord, I have heard your voice calling at a distance. <coughs> Guide my steps to you, Lord. Guide my steps to you. Lord, I have heard your voice calling at a distance. Guard my way to you, O Lord. Guard my way to you. Lord, I have heard your voice calling at a distance. Keep my heart for you, Lord. Keep my heart for you. Lord, I have heard your voice. Amen. The next prayer is called Reconciliation. O King of Kings, O King of the Universe, King who will be, who is, may you forgive us each and every one. Accept my prayer, O King of Grace. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother or sister lives in the light, and there is nothing to make that person stumble. Examine your heart. Lower my vengeance my anger and my hatred. Banish my wicked thoughts from me. Send down a drop from heaven of your Holy Spirit to vanquish this heart of rock of mine. Lord, let our memory provide no shelter for grievance against another. Lord, let our heart provide no harbour for hatred of another. Lord, let our tongue be no accomplice in the judgment of a brother. And then prayer of the heart. My eyes, my eyes have seen the King. The vision of his beauty has pierced me deep within. To whom else can I go? My heart, my heart desires him. He's touched something inside of me that's now reaching out for him. And I know that I must go. My God is my love, my God, my healing one. My bright love is my merciful Lord. My sweet love is Christ. His heart is my delight. All my love are you, O King of glory. Amen. I think at this point it would be good if we said the Lord's Prayer together. Together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to ask Steve to come and bring our reading. Thank you.
Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the great love that you have lavished on us, and we are just amazed at the way um, that you even forgave from the cross and your noble bearing through all the persecution that you received. And Lord, we just marvel at the amazing love that you show us. And we do pray now, Lord, that you would help us to understand what it is to um, be free, to be rid of the old nature and to put on the new self, to be made more like you. We pray that you speak our hearts and minds, particularly on this theme of anger. So uh, we pray that you lead us now by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, uh, dealing with anger. Dealing with anger. Uh, when most people think of anger, uh, they imagine a person in a rage. Uh, they picture uh, red faces, slamming doors, shouting, and uh, intimidation. And this is uh, one aspect of anger. But anger takes many forms. Uh, many do not regard themselves as angry individuals because they do not realise the many disguises that anger takes. Here's just a list of 16 variations of anger. Bitterness, malice, clamour, envy, resentment, intolerance, Criticism, revenge, wrath, hatred, seditions or party spirit, jealousy, attack, gossip, sarcasm, unforgiveness. Well, the passage from Ephesians. Uh, Steve kindly read for us, contains specific teaching about dealing with anger, which we're going to look at. But it also gives a wider a theological framework, which helps us to discern what a specifically Christian response should be. And we're going to look at those wider principles first of all. The passage shows us that our perspective on our anger is radically influenced by our belonging to Christ. Uh, we believers are now to exhibit a new lifestyle that contrasts with the old lifestyle we had before we came to know Christ. As Christians, we are no longer to conform to the world around us. We must no longer live as the Gentiles do, says Paul. And there he describes the uh, darkness of their futility of thought, their hardness of heart towards God, and their indulgence. And that's the case, isn't it? Once I believe the lie that God is not there, then I become the centre of the universe. And as a self-made man, I worship my creator and I give myself every form of self-indulgence. However, there is now a new lifestyle available for those who belong to Christ. And we believers are now children of light. And there is an alternative to the old lifestyle. We can be set free. A new way of living once you come under Christ's Lordship. And the new lifestyle is characterised by renewed thinking. Paul says you did not come to know Christ that way. And verse 21, you were taught in him in accordance with the truth in him. And the idea here is that of learning about how our faith in Jesus has implications for everything else that we do, including our value system. And as we join with other believers in learning the priorities of God's Word, as we see these exemplified in Christ's example, then of course there is less room for conflict and anger over what people want. As we learn the priorities of God's Kingdom, the more unity there is in our wanting the same things. <coughs> More light, less darkness. Further, we believers have, as Paul puts it, put off our old self and put on the new self. Verses 22 to 24. Put off our old self and put on the new self. And so Paul reminds them of a fundamental change that God has brought about within them. Resources they now have to help them live the Christian life. <coughs> Uh, when we became Christians, Christ, by his Spirit, 
put to death our old sinful nature, so we were repulsed at its corruption and deceit. Instead, we were made alive to God, so now we desire him and his goodness instead. Once a person is converted by the Spirit of God, the old nature no longer has that power or grip it used to have over them. By the Spirit, there is now an inner power and motivation to instead live for God. Uh, when you read of powerful conversions, where, where a person has been converted from an addictive lifestyle, perhaps alcoholic addiction or sexual immorality or greed or violence, whatever it might be, to then to be a person in love with Christ and wanting to experience his kingdom, to spread his kingdom, their conversion has taken place. In that person's spirit, God's spirit has crucified the power and grip of the old nature, and that person is now alive to God. I was going to read to you a testimony of a person converted from their anger. This person was a very angry man, and this conversion speaks of their conversion. Pastor Tim LaHaye describes a young man's visit to him. As soon as he was seated, he went into an angry 25-minute description of all the misery his wife had caused him <coughs> and how psychotic she was. When he, when he had finally unburdened himself, I began to present to him the gospel of Jesus Christ. The young engineer quickly informed me, well, I don't believe in Christ. It's not that I'm an atheist. I, I just don't believe well, restraining for the first time from my ministerial inclination to present the wonderful claims of Christ and the abundant proofs for his deity, I continued. I then explained about Christ's sacrifice for us on the cross and how when he comes into a life, that life is no longer self on the throne and all that subservient to self. Rather, Christ comes in and affects the radical change we have been thinking about so that person's love is first given to God since God is now on the throne of that person's life. And that first allegiance now benefits their relationships and values in general. And um, Lahey says, I drew two circles representing the non-Christian and the Christian life accordingly. I said, which of these two circles represents your life? And I was rather surprised when he replied, pointing to the non-Christian circle. Oh, that represents my life. That's a picture of me right there. Then, rather hesitantly, because he claimed not to believe in Christ, I said, well, do you know of any reason why right now you couldn't invite Jesus Christ into your life? To my utter amazement, he looked me straight in the face and said, no, in fact, that's exactly what I need. With that, he got down on his knees and began to pray. He first confessed what an angry, bitter, resentful young man he was, and he asked Jesus Christ to forgive him and come into his life. When he finished, he sat down and began to weep. I watched him for several minutes, after which he sighed and said, I've never felt so relaxed in all my life. Then it was that I saw the evidence of the working of God's Spirit in his life as a new Christian, for he said, by the way, Pastor, all those things I told you about my wife aren't really true. Forget it. Most of the problem has been me. Two weeks later, when he returned, I was intrigued by the fact that he had memorised some biblical verses I had assigned to him, completed a Bible study, and read his Bible every day simply because he was that kind of method methodical individual. Uh, when I asked him, how is your wife, he again revealed the complete transformation miraculously accomplished in his life by the Holy Spirit when he said, uh, she's not doing too good. Well, I guess that's understandable. It's going to take a long time to overcome the effects of all the things that I've done to her in our married life. <laughs> so this loving, gracious, compassionate young man was nothing like the angry, vitriolic, bitter individual of two weeks before. Again, another evidence of the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome man's natural weakness. Um, he goes on, an interesting result of this experience appeared two months later. His wife got down on her knees in their home and invited the Lord Jesus Christ into her life. She has been delivered of her problems of fear and no longer sees a psychiatrist. So that's um, conversion 
recorded in the book The Spirit Control Temperament by Tim Lahaye. But I hope you can see from the principles we've already looked at in Ephesians and this man's conversion that the distinctively Christian response to anger or any other sin is supernatural. A deep internal change in a person's life wrought by the Holy Spirit of God. And later we will see that kindness and compassion and forgiveness should replace bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander. But these positive qualities are not natural that we could produce them ourselves. They are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. God's own presence and enabling in the believer to effect change in our lives. But notice too that if a person belongs to Christ, their concern for purity of lifestyle is actually a concern for the unity of the church. Verse 25, we are all members of one body. So the concern to lay aside anger and stealing and lying and so on is because these are sins that hurt our relationships with each other. The Spirit's fruit produces qualities like love and long-suffering and self-control which deepen our love and our unity together. So a true Christian understanding of purity is never self-righteous, it's never holier than that. It's quite interesting on soaps and various programmes that sometimes Christians are depicted that way, um, as though they're just being holier than that. Uh, that is not the case. True purity of motive eradicates hostility, deception, gossip, passing blame, lust, selfish ambition and so on, but these all hurt fellowship. Rather, true holiness is conducive to love, forgiveness, encouragement and trust between God's people. You are still locked into anger if you separate yourself from a church and judge it. To overcome anger, God wants you to learn to do that within real relationships with other believers. To learn to love, so we smooth the rough edges off one another and so grow effectively. So with these wider principles in mind, we come to the first specific verses about anger. In your anger, do not sin, verse 26. Verse 27, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. So in your anger, do not sin. And here we see there is such a thing as Christian anger. God gets angry. He's angry at sin and injustice. John Stott writes, there is a great need in the contemporary world for more Christian anger. In the face of blatant evil, we should not be tolerant, but we should be indignant, not apathetic, but angry. In one of the chapters of the book, The Art of Compassion, musician Martin Smith writes about Prem Kiran, a Christian organisation working with the children of prostitutes in India. He says this, We tread the path to the houses. They're not houses, though. They're a few bricks, a collection of pens with roofs and doors and not much else. They have taps that offer clean water to trickle. But these homes are nothing I've seen before. I'm close to being sick as we walk around, treading over the sewer and feeling so dumb for wearing flip-flops. <laughs> it's the spirit of the place, though, as well as the smell that's getting me. The fact that under these bed beds, children hide while their mothers collect a few rupees from men they have sex with. Smith's indignation or anger at what is going on so consumes him, it motivates him to adopt one of the children and so save her from the same fate. Christian anger at evil is the companion of love. Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. There is a place for Christian anger. But in this phrase, there's also the admission that unrestrained anger leads to sin. Unrestrained anger leads to sin. Uh, anger can easily get mixed up with pride or spite or the desire to get even. Unrestrained anger gives the devil opportunity to undermine church unity. 
Instead, Paul says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. I mean, it's impossible to be in any family without finding a reason to get angry at some point. That's true in a church. Anger too easily leads to bitterness and resentment. Dr. Macmillan in none of these diseases says, the moment I start hating a man, I become his slave. I can't enjoy my work anymore because he controls my thoughts. My resentments produce too many stress hormones in my body and I become fatigued after only a few hours work. The work I formerly enjoyed is now drudgery. Even holidays cease to give me pleasure. The man I hate hounds me wherever I go. I can't escape his tyrannical grasp on my mind. Uh, when the waiter serves me porterhouse steak with french fries, asparagus, crisp salad and strawberry shortcake smothered with ice cream, well, it might as well be stale bread and water. My teeth chew the food and I swallow it, but the man I hate will not permit me to enjoy it. The man I hate may be many miles from my bedroom, but crueler than any slave driver, he whips my thoughts into such a frenzy that my inner spring mattress becomes a rack of torture. Once you have become a slave of the person who has angered you, the devil is given a foothold with which to damage your unity with Christ. Paul urges us to deal with anger like that promptly. Do it, he says, today before the sun sets, or at least before the bed light goes out. Be reconciled. And this may mean a painful working through the issue, an apology for your own part where you have sinned, on most occasions, this humility on your part is powerfully used by God to stir the conscience of the other so they confess their sin and seek reconciliation too. But if that person has sinned against you and they refuse to acknowledge their own part, you do not have to be controlled by them. As Minerth writes, you are not obligated to lock yourself in mortal combat with the other, correct his or her illogic, or continue trying to move the person to your point of view when it is clear that his or her feet are stuck in stubborn concrete. You can make a choice. So, state your position, pray for that person, commit it all to the Lord and his oversight, then get on with your life free of burden. You have done your part. Do you need to do that today? Maybe uh, your spouse, maybe a child, maybe someone in the church. Seek reconciliation. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Verses uh, 30 to 32 also directly address anger. They teach us that we are to be like God in the way we deal with broken relationships. We are to be like God in the way we deal with broken relationships. Verse 31 and 32, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ, God forgave you. So we can see how anger escalates if less to itself, as the verse indicates, bitterness, hardness of heart, resentment about the past, if not dealt with, this leads to anger and wrath. First explosion of rage, but then a settled state of seething anger. And if they are not dealt with, these lead to brawling, to clamour and slander, the unrestrained yelling, the public quarrel and verbal abuse. God says clearly, put that kind of anger behind you. It's part of your old nature. It's part of the old way you used to relate to people. Rather, says Paul, we are to deal with others in the way God has dealt with us. So in verse 2, 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Because that's the way God deals with broken relationships. All of us, by nature, deserve the anger of God. We deserve God's anger for the way we push him aside. But God in Christ chose to be kind towards us, compassionate towards us, and to forgive us. God's forgiveness cost Christ all that he had, but it was freely offered. This is to be the pattern of our relationships within the church family, and it will be costly. It will be costly to deal with resentments, resentments perhaps carried for years. 
someone says, I can't look certain people in the face because of the way they have hurt me. <laughs> but this is where forgiveness must come in. God says, be like me in the way you deal with those kind of broken relationships. Uh, I think reading inspirational accounts of costly forgiveness always gets our own battles in perspective. Uh, it's unlikely that any of us will ever have to deal with the kind of anger Suzanne Guest must have felt when her husband was murdered by Muslim extremists. She and Tillman were missionaries in Turkey, but somehow she was given the strength to forgive, only possible by the Holy Spirit's enabling. And this is her statement to the press. We came to this country to live a normal life, the same as the Turks came to Germany as Muslims. We wanted to come to Turkey and live here as Christians. For us, this is a very hard time. I have lost my lifelong friend, and the children have lost their father. But I know that Tillman died as a martyr in the name of Jesus Christ, and his blood was not in vain. For Turkey, this is a new start. Jesus said from the cross to the people around him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I want to do the same. It's amazing, isn't it? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, and I want to do the same. Suzanne Gesk's words remind us of the one we are to imitate, the one who shows us the Father. Paul affirms that we are to be like Christ in self-giving love towards others. Chapter 5, verse 2, live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. You know, we all get angry when we feel devalued, or that our worth as a person has been insulted, or some need of ours has been ignored or not met, or someone has shown contempt for us, our values or convictions. And it's like, it's like our anger keeps score of a record of wrongs. But anger is essentially selfish, but to be like Christ in self-giving love, it's like to rip up the score sheets and to throw it away. It's remaining quiet when you want to defend yourself because you've entrusted yourself to the Father. It's ignoring my rights. The Son of God had every right to receive worship and honour, but he was abused by his own creation. Instead, his love looked completely, completely to the interests of others, even to you and I. And through that very act of being unjustly treated, the act that should give vent to Christ's deepest anger and lead to his calling down legions of angels to strike those who have done this to him, through that very act, Jesus gives himself up for us. Live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. You know, none of us will love one another to the degree love Christ has loved us. But when he enables, enables us to do so in some measure, then that is the love that overcomes anger and every evil. God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Praise God for that. Well, let's worship him for his wonderful love for us. <coughs> we're going to sing over our heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free. It's number 495. Just a reminder as well, um, we have opportunity for prayer for any who want it. And uh, if anything's touched you and your heart and your mind through this service and you would like prayer, um, then there will be someone to pray for you after the service. Over a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free. Number 495. <laughs>
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. 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 Please be seated.